Good evening. I'm Reverend Steve Clegg, and I'm the interim pastor at Second Baptist Church, and this is our midweek Bible study. So if you will, um, like I say, if you turn in Zechariah, we're going to finish up Zechariah tonight. We're going to start out chapter 13, and um, we'll finish this series up tonight. Not sure where we'll go from there. Um, before we get into that, just a way of announcements. Um, Sunday school at 9, um, services at 10. And then if you still would like to utilize the option, we're still broadcasting over the radio um, simultaneously with our service. So you can come into the sanctuary or you can sit in the parking lot, whichever you're more comfortable doing, that's fine. Um, we'll be doing that over 87.9. And then also we put the message portion out on Facebook. The grand total for the Mother's Day offering for the month of May was $1,500. And then, remember the food pantry sponsored by the Methodist Church. Um, so, those are the announcements. Um, birthdays, June 4th um, was Marianne Edwards. June 5th was Billy McKenzie's. The 8th um, is the 39th anniversary of Kenneth and Shirley Freeman. So, we wish all of them well. Um, way of prayer request, uh, Marianne Edwards, Jada Clayton, Karen Clegg, um, David and Connie Warren, Matthew Ward, Mac McMorrow, Shannon and Daryl Britt, Chloe Akers, Janet House, Billy McKenzie, Linda and Cornelius Hunt, the Frisch family, Kyle Edwards, Taylor Fields, Ashley Blanks, Lee Stevens, Cynthia McMorrow and family, Ashley and Zaley Emman, Paulette Faison, BJ Norris, Tommy Eford, Rosemary Taylor, Louise and Ron Rising, Melody Oakley, Jennifer Milligan, Sheila Milligan, Hunter Kinlaw, Michael Davis, as I understood, Michael had an appointment this week, um, but wasn't feeling well, so he canceled that appointment. Um, and then Jim Miss Kelly, Ruby Johnson, Cheryl Barker, Kathy Beanie, Ronnie King, Barbara Walters. Um, Barbara was having an appointment this week. Have heard a follow up on that. Uh, Mary Beard, member of the school systems. The pulpit committee, our church, the lost nation, its leaders, troops and their families, police officers, and then the pastors and their families. Um, added to that, um, let's see here, getting on the right page here. Member Bethany Hooker, um, also um, Cheryl Starter, Tina Chasen, um, was in the hospital having an issue with her heart. They did some kind of procedure, and as I understood, she came home, um, I believe, yesterday, doing better. Um, so, like I say, um, like I say, Barbara has hers. Um, Tammy is waiting. Her results on her biopsy. She's saying about a week, two weeks. Keep praying for her. Betty Connie's sister um, is having knee issues, looking at surgery somewhere down the road. Shanna out in Texas um, is in need of prayer. Um, Aviana, um, the test came back, uh, praise report there, um, doing fine, no issues there. Um, a friend of ours in um, Lumberton, Sam Boone, um, was rushed into emergency surgery as I understand it, um, had an intestinal blockage and ended up going in and removing part of his, um, one of his intestines. Um, they left it open and then went back in again today for a follow-up. Um, and as we understand, getting reports from that family, everything came out okay there. So um, just keep him in prayer. He's got a road recovery there. And then um, friends of our family, um, as we mentioned Sunday, their daughter Ashley, who lives in Alaska, um, they're all excited about her baby coming, and she lost her baby at four months. So our prayers go out to her as well. So a lot of different things going on, um, a lot of different needs. Um, continue to member of the country. Um, it's the end of the school year, so like special prayer for the children of schools. Um, we're coming into summer, which means it's holiday travel. Um, and with that, um, Interstate 95, if it isn't busy enough now, it's going to be busier, at least for the summer as people go on vacation and then with all the construction. So we pray for safe travels for them, but also for safety for the um, construction workers as well. Um, so different things going on there. Hmm. With that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, 
Lord, we just thank you for this day, and Father, we just thank you for many blessings, and Father, we just praise you and give you the glory, and God, direct us, Father, help us to do all things. And Father, we just ask that you'll just bless those on our prayer list, Lord. We just have so many that have so many different needs, and we know it's just to take the iceberg. And there's so many other needs within it, um, as individuals have their own private and personal prayer list, Lord. Father, we just pray that you'll be with those families who have lost loved ones, and these Young mothers who have lost their babies, um, Father, we just pray that you just bless them. Lord, it's never easy. And Father, we pray for those who have appointments this week and have or are awaiting test results and procedures done. Recently, Father, we know it's never easy. Um, the waiting is always the worst part. And Father, we just pray for good results and for answers. Most of all, Lord, we just pray that your healing hand be upon them bless them Lord as they go through these things and Father we just lift up all the different ones on our prayer list Lord if we go through our prayer list and concerns we have Father we have those on our prayer list that are battling cancer we have the other ones who are battling breathing issues um, of various types um, we have diabetes we have heart issues we have blindness um, uh, one that's kind of odd that a lot of times on our prayer list and Father these are all physical needs and we just lift them up to to you Lord and just ask that you'll meet those and the others that are there but Father we also have spiritual needs within the church and within the church family and our extended families Lord and friends and Father there's a great many that need salvation in our lives so Father we just lift them up to, to you and Ask Julius to bless them, Lord. We pray that the Spirit will convict their hearts and that they'll turn their lives to you, Lord. And Father, we also pray. We also pray and give you the praise for those who have recently had surgery and different events in their life that are going through physical therapy, as David Warren is and Luck Warren is, Lord. They're going through physical therapy, but they're getting stronger and seeing improvement. Father, we just thank you for that and just pray that you'll continue to bless them, Lord, as we're going through these type of activities and these events. And Father, we just pray. We pray for a nation. So far, we've strayed from you, Lord. And Father, we just lift up the sins of our nation. Father, you say the prayers of a righteous and availeth much. And Father, as a church, as a body, we're just lifting up our nation, Lord lifting it up to you that you will just reach down and touch it Lord that you can heal the people's spirit and that you can heal our land Lord that this nation will turn its heart back to you Father bless it and keep it and Father we pray for our children in the schools and at home Father just read an agonizing case today that was in the news five-year-old little boy just abused those cases are so heart-wrenching the child was left tied up for long periods of time had been placed in a dog kennel was beaten with different household objects broomsticks and whatnot what really made it sad is that the mother don't condoned it and let it go on and didn't do anything about it and other children in the house were also abused and saw the abuse of the others. Father, protect our children. It's sad when we read these things and see these things. And Father, we just pray for the children, both at home and at school, Lord. We pray they have something to eat and a safe place to sleep and a, a place to stay. Father, bless them. Father, we pray. We pray for our churches. We pray that our churches will work together. We pray that as a church that we'll lift up each other, help each other, Lord. That we will be a soul-winning, disciple-making church, Lord. A church that reaches to the lost and doesn't wait for them to come to us, but that we go to them, Lord. That every day as we walk out and walk around and do the things in our lives, the Father, that people see Jesus. 
that we call them to him. Father, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us where we've gone against your will, Father. May we be willing vessels in all things to do thy will. And Father, bless our police officers, our first responders. Father, bless them and keep them safe. Watch over them. And Father, bless our military. Watch over the soldiers, wherever they be, home or abroad, Lord. Keep them safe. Father God, this Bible says, we wrap up this book of prophecy, Lord. Help us to draw meaning from it. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, like I say, be turning over to Zechariah, chapter 13. Um, like I say, we're going to try to wrap up tonight. I think we'll we'll do it. Um, and one of the things, and I don't know if you've noticed it, I've noticed it in different places, and the commentary has pointed out a lot of times, um, pardon me, my sinuses are starting to give it fits this evening. <clears throat> Must be that time of day, I guess. Um, but we'll see parallels. Um, in this, we see Isaiah and Jeremiah um, parallel. Um, what Zechariah talked about last time was the repentance of sin. And, you know, a lot of times we talk about repentance of sin, we're talking New Testament, but they're actually, in the Old Testament, so we talk about repentance of sin in the Old Testament. And, and all, but, and like I say, we're going to see it, and Zechariah addresses it, but we really don't see this repentance in Israel until a much later time um, before they actually do it. So we're going to start out in Zechariah chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. And in that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. And it shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, then his father and his mother shall that began him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live, for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and his mother that began him shall thrust him through when he prophesieth. And it shall come to pass in that day that the prophets shall be ashamed every one of his vision when he hath prophesied, neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive. But he shall say, I am no prophet, I am a husbandman, for a man taught me to keep the cattle from my youth. One shall say unto him, What are these words in thy hands? Then he shall answer, Those which with I was wounded in the house of my friends. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow. Saith the Lord of hosts, Smiteth the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn my hand upon the little ones. A lot of different things in this scripture, and a couple that we're going to look at. Um, the very first thing... Um, Verse 1 is talking about salvation from Jesus Christ, a perfect sacrifice. Um, in that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. That's, that's redemption. That's salvation. There's only one way we can get salvation. That's Jesus Christ. Um, it's perfect. And there is even a hymn based on this verse called There is a Fountain Filled with Blood. And that's by William Cowper. And also... It's interesting sometimes you go through the Old Testament you'll see different verses and like, man, that phrase sounds familiar. And then you think about, oh yeah, there's a, there's a song about it. There's a hymn. And all, some of them are eloquently put and um, picked up and used in different songs and hymns. Um, now, the Jews can make themselves ceremonially or externally clean, but not their sinful hearts. It's one thing when they you know, get themselves right and what they would do, they go through these different things. This is, you know, you know, so I'll be clean before God. But the problem was, it wasn't the external that was dirty. It was the internal. And the only way that you're ever going to clean up the internal is through the blood of Jesus. But, you know, the Jews thought, well, if we wash this way and we wear certain garments and we do certain things and we don't touch certain things at all, we can be clean and Everything. Well, you might be clean on the outside, but you're not going to be clean on your heart unless your heart is clean by the blood of Jesus. And in this, God is setting forth not only to cleanse the sinful hearts, but the land also. We talk a lot of times about the sin and how it affects the people. But if you go back and you read the Old Testament and you read all the way back into Genesis, when there was sin, 
God cursed the land. Remember, there was no thorns and and everything upon the land. There was none of the bad. But God cursed the land as well as man. So that man would not have an easy time. And so, you know, the, the land also cries out for God. We look at it as an intimate, inanimate but in reality, in God's eyes, it's part of creation, and it also cries out to Him. So the sinful hearts are going to be clean, but also the land is going to be clean. That's part of it. Remember, Israel, you know, they weren't hang, let anybody hang after sunset upon a tree. You know, they were not supposed to shed innocent blood upon the land because that would foul the land. God's saying, not only is the people going to be cleansed, but the land also. Um, because in this Israel was plagued by two sins primarily um, that kept coming back idols and false prophets we today are plagued by the same thing and a lot of people say well we don't worship idols and yeah we do we worship a lot of idols as a matter of fact a lot of people look at their selves as gods or look at their selves as idols they worship sports idols. They worship, you know, movie stars as idols. They worship possessions as idols. They, they worship money as an idol to a lot of people. They put their faith in money instead of God. There was a question this morning, I think it was, on one of the Bible studies, or one of the gentlemen doing a thing, and he said, if you had to choose money or choose God, which would you choose? And of course, a quick and easy answer for the Christian, oh, I would choose God. But how many really do it day in and day out? And that was his point. So many of us worry as Christians that we're worried about the financial and not the spiritual. And it's not that he was condemning that, you know, yeah, we have to have money to live in this world. That's not what he was saying. It was no way, shape, or form of what he was saying. What he was saying is that people's faith in their money went further than their faith in God. That is an interesting discussion if you think about it. But it's also a very painful truth for a lot of people. Push comes to shove, they turn to their money to get them out of trouble instead of turning to God and having faith that God will bring them through. So like I say, keep that in mind when you're looking at things. Because yes, we have idols. We also have false prophets. And, you know, we may not say them as such and call them prophets at all, but we have those who will, if you look around, you can find a church, and when you go to that church, you'll find that they'll only tell you things that you like to hear. They don't tell you the cold, hard truth or the facts of the Bible. They tell only the things that's going to make you feel better. That's a false prophet. Or those who will tell you this is going to happen or that's going to happen or you need to do this and do that and claiming all these other different things and people will turn it into religion and believe them. There is the religion of the world and the people follow it by the hordes. Now, I cannot help but think that this is fitting for today because like I say, it looks like our world. Does it not? Does it not look like our world? How many people do we see that are clinging to God versus clinging to the things of the world? And it's not just our generation. It's been that way in all the generations in varying extents. The question is how the church reacts to it and what the church does. Do we curl up in a ball and hide within our sanctuaries and say, oh, it's going to be okay, we don't need to go out and talk to those people? Or do we realize, oh, what a great need there is in the world to hear about Jesus? And go out and talk to these people who are worshiping their other gods and they don't look at them as gods, they look at them as possessions or things that they are in the sense that they have control over them. And in that sense that they have control over their life and their destiny and all these different things that are inanimate, and all, they essentially are looking at themselves as a God as well. Sometimes you got to bring people the truth. Now, we'll see 
how the verses go on to describe the cleansing of the land. The idols are removed and remembered no more. The false prophets are sought out and destroyed. The false prophets will be killed by their own parents, which is what verse 3 is telling us. The parents will accuse them of lies in the name of the Lord and thrust them through and kill them. Bearing a false witness against God or against his word was worthy of death in the Old Testament. Then it says the false prophets will try to hide in verse 4 and not wear the garments of a prophet, but try to blend in with the people and hide among them. And they'll deny that they're a prophet, but say I'm a herdsman of the cattle or a farmer. They'll lie about the wounds and the scars on their bodies that they've been doing. An idol worship member, the priest in Baal, when you know Elijah was confronting him, what did they start to do? They started gashing themselves and stabbing themselves and cutting themselves and all out on Mount Carmel in order to get Baal's attention. And Elijah just laughed at him for it. He thought it was funny. How much more are they going to put themselves through to a God that's not real? Now, all of this killing and destroying of the false prophets is in accordance with God's law. It's found in Deuteronomy 6. And if you look at just a portion of it, verses six or verses 1 through 5. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of the prophet or the dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or the dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commandeth thee to walk in. So shall thou put the evil away from the midst there of thee. Harsh words. Don't go after idols. Don't become a false prophet of idols. It's worthy of death. Now, God is not tolerant of those that lead his people away. Wow. For those who do not truth, teach the truth of the Bible, if they are not careful, and there's a lot of ministers say, I only teach about positive things, or I only teach about these things. That's fine, but be careful in doing that because when you say the only teach of this or that, if you're not giving them the whole truth and you're leading them away, and God says that's very dangerous. Ooh. Excuse me, I apologize for that. And also God says I'm not going to be tolerant of it. And um, so anything that puts... Anything that is put ahead of God in your life becomes a God. If you say, well, I'm not going to go to church. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to read my Bible. I'm going to go do this instead. You just made that instead more important than God to you. Be careful there. Anything we put ahead of God can be viewed as an idol. Or a false god. That is an interesting statement, but it's a true statement, and we have to be careful there. And the thing of it is, people who push these type of things, in a sense, can become false prophets because they're pushing the things of the world or the things that you shouldn't be following and trying to get you to go follow them. But, you have to make the decision. Do I follow it? Or do I listen to it? Or do I listen to my heart and listen to my scriptures and follow God? Be careful how you attack these things and how you go after them. Verse 7. 
this is a direct image of Christ, the foretelling of his death, the, the scattering of um, his people, so such as a verse is about Christ, that is in Matthew 26 and 31, listen to this, then saith Jesus unto thee, all ye shall be offended because of me for this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep and the flock shall be scattered abroad. Again, verse 7 says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn my hand upon the Lord. Same thing. Consistency in Scripture. Jesus was directing the passage at his disciples that night. It took on even a greater meaning in 70 AD when Jerusalem was destroyed and the Jews were scattered to the four corners of the earth at that time. So like I say, it came about in different means of what you know they probably were expecting. But at the same time, the same thing was accomplished. So let's look at verses 8 and 9 of Zechariah 13. And it shall come to pass that in the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and I will try them as gold is tried, and they shall call on my name, and I will hear them. And I will say, It is my people, and they shall say, The Lord is my God. This is or may not be a good time to be a Hebrew, for the odds are against you as God carries out his plan. For out of all the Jews, only one in three will survive the next part of the prophecy. One in three survived to the next part of the prophecy. Two thirds of the Jews will be cut off and die. For that part that survives is those that hold the gospel and declares the Lord is my God. One of the things the Jew is famous for when they would make promises to God but turn out and go right out there and walk against them. Oh, we'll do what God says. We'll do what his word. We'll keep the commandments. We'll keep the Sabbath. We'll do all these things. And then turn around and walk out the door. And some of them just walk and do what they pleased. Sounds like a lot of Christians. You could say you hear a lot of altar call talk sometimes from people. And then they walk right out the door and go right back to what they were doing. That's why it's we got to be careful and we got to work with each other and gotta encourage each other and all to help us to stay the course all week long. We can't rely on our own strength to make it. We have to have that spiritual fellowship. We have to have the spiritual strength and all because it's not going to come from us. It's got to come from God. So those that truly believe and hold on to God even through the fires of the refining process, which is which is where much dross is discovered and removed and discarded. The key thing is God is response to their calling. They call on the name. They call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, "It is my people." How many times has God promised Israel, "You will keep my statutes and walk in my ways and follow these things"? I will be your God, and you will be my people. God wants to have this, but it's been missed so much. The last section of the study of Zechariah deals with the Lord's reign. Zechariah 14 and 9, we're jumping out ahead. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth, and in that day shall there be one Lord, and his name one. This is a glorious time, and a time we should be looking for. For in this section that we're going into, the scriptures will see several distinct events and changes from verse 9. And then, and like I say, starting at verse 9, we'll see the establishing of the kingdom. Sometimes it's interesting in Scripture how you come to a point and it stops here at this time and jumps way out ahead sometimes. We're going to kind of see that. So, like I say, um, in this, verse 9, it says, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth, and that day shall be one Lord, and his name one. We have to keep looking for it. Zechariah 14, 8 through 11. And it shall be in that day that the living water shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them towards the former sea and half of them towards the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. And as I read verse 9, and in verse 10 it says, And all the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Rimen, 
south of Jerusalem, and it shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place, from Benjamin's gate unto the place of the first gate, unto the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananiel unto the king's wine press. And men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. Alright, what are we seeing here? One, we're going to see um, a break, and we looked at it before in a previous study. Jerusalem will have a river. Jerusalem was not built by a large river. Yet, was a great and ancient city. In a time to come, a great river will flow out of Jerusalem. You say, how does a river start out of Jerusalem? God creates it. Um, the river will connect the former sea and the dead sea. To the hinder sea, the Mediterranean sea, the dead sea will be revived and have life as well as the land that is watered by the river. So this river that is flowing out of Jerusalem, remember the Dead Sea is a salt sea, but if you keep pump enough fresh water into it, it will change and be diluted enough that you actually can have a sea with life. And one of the things I remember seeing it, and it really don't pertain here, but just as an interesting fact, if you look at aerial images of the Dead Sea, in a time lapse sequence going back many years to now, you will notice that the Dead Sea is getting smaller. It's drying up because it doesn't have a real good fresh feed of water into it. You know, so like I say, the Dead Sea is getting smaller from all counts from what I've seen in the, the photos. And that was part of the, what one of the gentlemen was pointing out, one of the things I was looking at. Now. You have a river flowing out of Jerusalem going in two directions, towards the Mediterranean Sea and towards the Dead Sea. The lay of the land will change around Jerusalem. It will be lowered to become a plain while the Temple Mount will be raised. Sounds like a lot of earthquakes if you think about it. Of things. Jerusalem will be the safe place to live, although it has not always been that way. Now it will be that way. The danger is removed. No longer will Jerusalem need the mountains around it to protect it. Um, as we read in earlier studies, and the, child, the children can play in the streets and the elderly can sit outside and talk and be safe. Jerusalem becomes a nice place in the end times. Verses 16 through 21 of chapter 14. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of the host, and to keep the feast of the tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem, worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall no rain, excuse me, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, and have not have no rain, there shall be the plague, wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of the tabernacles. This shall be the punishment for Egypt of Egypt, and the punishment of all nations that come not up to the keep the feast of the tabernacles. In that day there shall be upon the bells of the horses. There sh uh, let me start that again. In that day shall there be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord. And the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls at before the altar. So on these bells on the horses, there's an inscription that says what? Holiness unto the Lord. It's interesting, the titles and the messages there, right? So verse 21, Yet every pot in Jerusalem and Judah, and Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts, and all that they sacrifice shall come, and take of them, and seeth, see therein, and in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. The Gentiles will come to Jerusalem to worship. We don't look upon that much. But yet, the Gentiles are coming to Jerusalem. We often just think of Jerusalem, we think of the Jews. 
and they're coming to worship is what it tells us in 16. They will come annually to celebrate the Feast of the Tabernacles, a reminder of the blessings from God. Those that do not come up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, the rain will be cut off in their countries. They will experience drought and the plague and God uses to smite the heathen that do not come to worship God. Holiness will be the way of life. In all aspects of life, people will be holy towards the Lord. We need to be holy creatures. We need to strive for holiness. We need to strive for righteousness. We need to strive for perfection. And all. Perfection being not sinless, although we should strive not to sin, but complete or full in Christ. So with that, Paul reminds us over in 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Don't hold back. Everything you do, you do it as to the Lord. That in itself will create a witnessing atmosphere around you. If you go out into public and everything that you do in public, walk, talk, sing, whatever it is, and you do it as to the Lord, you will draw people to you because you're going to be an image of Christ in their life. Not that you will be worshipped, but that you can present the love of Christ to them as you know it. So with that, where are we at? Repentance? That's what the prophets call for. In the church today, are we working harmoniously? Are we working together? Are we lifting up God? Is it God first or is it our wants? You know, a lot of people say, well, we come to church, it's always God first. That's not true. That is not true. You will be amazed at the number of people who do not, who do not put God first and they're sitting in the pews of the church. It's a great place for them to sit because hopefully they'll get the message and get it right. But at the same time, by them coming and people knowing, they also could be a ministry against the church. And for that, they would have to pay. So that concludes Zechariah. Like I said, I'm not sure where we're going next time. Um, I'll have to do some looking and figuring and seeking guidance. Um, where we're going. Um, we may jump in back into the New Testament. We may jump into another book. We still have several Old Testament books we haven't looked at, but um, we just have to walk through it when we get there. So with that, um, I wish you a good night. I pray that God will bless you. And take some time. Go back and read through Zechariah. And realize what it is that God's telling us through Zechariah. There's a lot of stuff there that is for our lives, too. So with that, God bless and have a good night.